Good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Victor Benitez, the manager of the labs, which is located downstairs on the A level. Please welcome to the auditorium for our first in-person maker talk in the modernized MLK Library for Creating Public Art, How Do You Make a Sculpture with an Entire Community? with Michael Janis of the Washington Glass School and Studio. Before we begin, please silence your personal devices. Um, and please note that this talk is being live streamed live on YouTube. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, now, please let me introduce the talk. The term public art can make one think of old bronze statues of a soldier on horseback in a park. Today, public art can take a wide range of forms, sizes, and scales. It often interprets the history of the place, its people, and perhaps addresses a social or environmental issue. The Washington Glass Studio works involving the surrounding neighborhoods in the creation of their large-scale works as a way to achieve a positive impact on a community through public art. The Washington Glass School and Studio is a unique arts resource to the DC area, celebrating 21 years this September. Our presenter today, Michael Janis, was an architect for 20 years. Working 10 years as a designer in Australia, he returned to the United States in 2003 and moved to DC to focus on his glass art career. He was awarded a Fulbright scholarship in 2012, where Michael went to England's University of Sutherland and the UK's National Glass Center where he became an artist in residence at the Institute for International Research in Glass. Often featured in American Craft Magazine, his artwork is also in the permanent collection of the Art Institute of Chicago, Florida's Imagine Museum, Fort Wayne, Indiana's Museum of Fine Art, and Boston's Fuller Craft Museum. Next month, a large glass sculpture made by Michael and his Washington Glass School cohort, Tim Tate, will be unveiled in Murano as an event in Italy's Venice Biennial. Please welcome Michael Janis. Thank you, Victor. Hi there. It's an honor to be invited by the Maker's Lab to speak here at the MLK Library. Back in the day, I was an architect in Chicago and being able to present an historic building designed by Mies in the 60s, and I was a student there in the 70s. It's like I'm coming home. Uh, I want to talk today about our studio and how we go around making public art, and in detail, really focus on one project, which was the Green Gateway Arch at uh, Ward 7. Next slide. The Glass School is an active art studio with hands-on workshops that focus on the glass medium, but it also incorporates many other mediums. Next slide. The studio encourages interaction and experimentation. We want the artists to learn the craft and then tell their story in the art. In glass, there's three main ways that you can affect glass, hot, warm, and cold. Next slide. Hot glass, or blown glass, becomes molten at around 2,000 degrees. It's kind of got a thick honey consistency, and it's worked on a pipe to shape. It's also ladle cast into sand molds or on a smaller scale with a torch. But we don't do that at our school. Next slide. Cold glass means it doesn't require heat to shape it. You can cut glass flat and then assemble it. Cold glass techniques include some things like sandblasting or etching uh, or stained glass. This also we don't do at the glass school. Next slide. And here we are at the glass school, uh, Washington Glass School, where we work with warm glass. And that falls into the categories between those other two techniques. You work on with the glass when it's cold, but then you heat it up to melt inside a kiln. Next slide. At the glass school, we work with glass in kilns. Electric kilns are reportedly the most environmentally sustainable ways to melt glass. And the complex we're in in Mount Rainier, Maryland is converting itself into being a solar powered studios. Next slide. 
We do have a number of different kilns at the kiln at the school. Some are small, some are huge, and that allows us to work at very different methods and scales. Next slide. We are part of a larger arts community, and we have many artists from different medias working at the Glass School, making components for their artwork. At the start of the pandemic, we actually started, uh, we had made glass panels for personal protective equipment, PPE, for the University of DC that was charged with making 3D printed equipment for the DC hospitals. Next slide. The school is run by three artists. It was founded by artist Tim Tate and Erwin Timmers in 2001. I joined the school in 2003 and became co-director in 2005. Each of the directors has a different approach to the material as a way of expression. Next slide. Tim Tate, one of the founders, creates artwork with mixed media videos, uh, electronics, lighting, acrylics, he likes to integrate cast objects within sometimes some very ornate settings. He has works in museums around the world. Next slide. This is some of his works that you can kind of get a glimpse at. He does do a lot with endless mirrors where the image just keeps on repeating itself into a, almost a sense of infinity. He also will work at getting some kinds of gold plating on some of his frameworks that he has cast, just really giving a sense of luxe to each piece. Next slide. This large cast glass piece was uh, part of last year's Venice Biennale in Italy, and later it was shown at the Russian Hermitage. Oh, jumped ahead. It, nope. Back one more. There you go. This was part of the Venice Biennale exhibit and was later shown at Russia's State Hermitage Museum. And as far as we know, it's out of Russia, someplace in Italy. So with the world changing as it is, we just hope that it's all fine. Next slide. Erwin Timmers, he was the other co-founder and director, and he's a leading eco-artist. He uses recycled glass, and he often explores themes of waste and environmental concerns. He also mixes media, steel and LED, and he uses them to showcase his cast recycled glass sculptures. Next slide. These large scale works of Irwin are currently on exhibit at Coppin State University outside of Baltimore. And it's part of a show that is from the United Nations Year of Glass events. Next slide. These are works by Irwin that were commissioned for a residential complex off Rhode Island Avenue in Brentwood where he has images of recycled glass and how it becomes an elements in the glass that are showing how things can be recycled. So it's almost like tumbling down tetras to say this is where uh, a story is in each panel. Next slide. These are some images of my artwork. Uh, I, I do figures. The images you see of figures are actually made out of crushed glass powder that's melted into the glass. Next slide. Sometimes the scale will be very large, and I use that to draw the, the viewer into the story and really connect with the portraits that I'm making in the images. But I like to work where I fracture or abstract the images to make them a little bit more contemporary and open to interpretation. Next slide. I do like to deconstruct a portrait and make it abstract with bright colors and, and fusing on textures and patterns to really uh, bring a different depth to the uh, uh, image. Next slide. When the school was founded, uh, we wanted to create an entity that, that would allow large scale commissions, especially for public art projects. As directors of the Glass School, each one of us brings their background to our public art projects. Tim Tate has worked with glass as a sculptural medium for the past 30 years. Erwin Timmers has a strong background in steel sculpture and electronics. And with my background as an architect, this really helps move forward the many steps that it takes to bring public art to life. Next slide. At the studio, we have a number of public art sculptures from the monumental doors at the Library of Congress, the Laura Library artwork at the entrance, 
the William Beans Community Center, and most recently at a residential tower in Arlington. Next slide. As I said, there are many steps that goes into the making of public art, from the initial design to structural specifications, fabrication, installing, and the final fitting out of the artwork. It's a lot like building a building, which brings us to the Green Gateway Arch at DC's Ward 7. Next slide. We had responded to DC Commission on the Arts call for public art proposals. Next, next. And part of that process was to visit the site and meet with the surrounding residents and community leaders to get their input. Next. We did that. Oh, go back. We jumped ahead a little bit too much. Yep. Yeah, can say. Uh, we did that and we found that many there felt that their neighborhood was the gateway to DC and that one that most passed through and never really noticed it. We also heard their concerns about the possibility that many artworks, the few they had in that neighborhood, would be destroyed by gangs. And this had a great impact on how we were going to approach the design. Next slide. We countered the concern of vandalism by inviting everyone in the neighborhood to join us and make glass artwork that would be part of the sculpture. If they were worried that the kids would damage something that was plopped down in the plaza, then invite them to be part of making the artwork. The idea that by making the community, by, uh, that by making with the community, this would create a strong sense of ownership. And it would, was a change in how we normally made artworks, where we normally think of it as artists themselves making it, fabricating it, installing it, and it was by the artist on a story. This one opened up the concept to involve the neighborhood and be all together to have one concept built by all. We had parameters to keep it workable, like setting the dimensions of the glassworks and a very tight color scheme, but it was going to create something unexpected and new. Next slide. Inspired by the community comments and research, we designed a grand gateway arch over 13 feet high. We began working on models and drawings to study all the different structural implications. We did hire a structural engineer to finalize the foundation sizes and the steel sections, but we also said, let's tie back to those initial community concerns and make this a green color palette that was highlighted by amber and purple accents throughout the glass. Next slide. The steel structure we had made with a local company in Bladensburg, and it's one that made bridges, which is kind of the way that the loads of the arch would have to endure. We also made allowances within the structure that would allow for LED lighting so that the whole structure would glow. Next slide. Working with the DC Commission on the Arts, uh, I think we jumped ahead one. No, okay, next. Working with the DC Commission of the Arts, the local ANC and the area council members, we got the word out to the neighborhood that workshops were taking place. The glass making workshop was at the glass school and we plan to take people through the entire process of making glass and all the steps necessary to make the components. Next slide. The glass making workshops were exactly like quilting bees in early America, only with glass. And after the first one, the word of mouth spread and people, whole families started joining as part of this. The response was so strong that we had to add extra days to accommodate the number of people. The woman on the right, Nadia, she had never worked in glass before. And as an artist, she loved it. She was inspired by the glass. And so she came to every one of the workshops, making stencils to improve her work each time. And that involvement really inspired us. So as we were selecting what tiles go where, I made sure that all of her tiles were featured prominently. Next slide. The glass masterpieces were coming out of the kiln. In so many different forms of expression, abstract, complex patterns, commemorating the year of the artwork was made, almost anything that could be imagined. But the making of glass is just one part of the process. Each tile would have to be cut to size and mounted into the steel framework. 
And I think that caused Irwin to go crazy. Next slide. Balancing the color and patterns, uh, we laid out the tiles into the steel framework, trying to give it an even feel and distribution. We were acting in the sense as curators for how the artwork uh, by the community was being made. And then we were ready to go to site. Next slide. On site, you begin the ballet of the structure to begin. Once the framework was bolted and set, the panels could then be mounted to the structure. The panel arrangement made the installation go fairly quickly. Next slide. And these are shots of the finished work. And again, we have a lot of people who will come and look for where their tiles have ended up and the relationship of their work with the next piece. Click next. Okay. And as strong as the daytime views uh, are, they, at nighttime, the internal lighting makes the artwork a glowing beacon. It really has become a landmark for that area. And the concerns that the community had about vandalism haven't proved true. The way we had designed the artwork was that if any of the tiles was damaged, uh, which could happen, you're able to pop it out and replace it. We had uh, so many tiles from the response that we actually provided a box of all the extra tiles so that in case that there's a likelihood of anything being damaged, they could be replaced. We haven't had to replace anything so far. So knock on laminate that it keeps up that way. Next slide. This is a comparison from the initial concept to the final piece as it was installed. Click next. So it's pretty true in terms of how the artwork and the final piece came together. Next slide. The success of this project led us to incorporate some form of community interaction as many of our projects that we can possibly include it in. Uh, other community-based projects includes the Peppermill Community Center in Landover, the William Beans Community Center in Suitland, and the Laurel Public Library. The Laurel Public Library uh, also had coverage by the Baltimore Sun, and we, again, we ended, added more classes because of the public response that they all wanted to be part of their artwork. That place also has such a sense of ownership that if a kid sticks a sticker on the building, we get a call from a neighbor saying they want us to go out and touch up the sculpture because someone has affected the thing. And we'll happily do that because we like to be idea that that's a place that they say they bring all visitors to show their artwork. Okay, so the next slide, that's gonna be wrapping it up. And I'm gonna have some live samples here. So if anyone's interested in seeing what the glass actually looks like up close, you can come up and touch it. Uh, that is one of the things that the Maker Lab here at DC, and if you have not been to the Maker Lab in the uh, MLK Memorial Library, you should go there. It's a fantastic facility. I know that glass is something they have not yet added as part of their situation, but I've never seen such a great setup for a facility of a maker's lab. So I encourage anyone to come and see it. And from that, I can show you these pieces. One of them is a maquette that we use to explain how the artwork would be created. And it is a working maquette. So you can see how the glass and the color works together. And there's a texture to it so that when you come up to it, you can talk to it and feel it and understand what it is that is in the glass and how dimension and texture are part of the artwork. And then right here is another piece, since that's a small scale. This is a larger scale sample, where you can see all sorts of imagery. It's glass, so you do have that translucency. So when it's lit from behind, it really has a glowing quality to it and a dimensional uh, beauty that, that is only something you get from glass. So when you think of any other materials, when you think of stone, 
when you think of metal, they all are nice, they all can work, but glass is so nice because it's strong, it's durable, it can be scrubbed clean, and it has a great color quality to it that you can't really achieve with paints. And the colors are permanent because they're part of the glass. And that is actually the windup of my public art talk. Again, I'm gonna encourage anyone, if they are in DC, they should check out the maker's lab in the basement of the uh, main branch library on G Street. And I thank you very much. Mike, do I have a question? Uh, yes. Um, can you talk to, so you were working with, were, were there disagreements among the members about what the sculpture should look like or represent? Um, how did you maybe work through those disagreements? Okay, well, some, there is some latitude as the artist. You're, you are given a, a concept piece that we're going through. And we are in competition with other people. So there was a shape that the community, when presented different options, chose the one we had come up with as a concept. So the initial hurdle of what the overall shape would be. There would be some people who have concerns or objections as to what goes in individual tiles. But because it was so many components were part of it, if one person said I wanted to be about family and another person said I want it to be about uh, sports, you could accommodate all of that. And then I'm just relying on us as being artists and curators that we're gonna start keeping a balance of it. When we had done the uh, DC Arch in Ward 7, we did have people doing anything from uh, the only thing we actually said we don't want to have is ads. So if a local manufacturer wanted to put their name in, we'd say you have to be a little bit more abstract. We do have references to the uh, ACN. We have things to Unity. Those are the only ones where I said I'm fine with it being more directly tied to the community rather than a individual or a person or uh, a business. So those are the ways that we handle that. And again, since we were playing the role of the head architect by being the artist, we could say it just didn't work. Or if someone had a tile that was so bad, that would be one that I would say, this is in the, to be replaced if something goes wrong. But happily, the colors were, worked out great. The way that the people worked on the artwork was inspiring for us as the artists organizing the event that we said, this is working out really good. There are some pieces and sometimes when you are a working community, you will say this is the most spectacular image where one of them was, I, I had the outline of a person's head and I wanted the brain to be expressed on that. And they said, no, we don't wanna see a brain pattern. We wanna see butterflies and have butterflies flying out. And I'm saying, that's pretty, but the idea of butterflies flying out of someone's head might have a different meaning than saying intelligence and learning, which is what we wanted that story to be. But again, it's a broad enough scope and there's sometimes that you make balances back and forth to say what will make the artwork stronger. And, and as an architect, I'm gonna say that goes with any kind of job you have. You're gonna have some times that you'll say this won't work and no matter what you do, if the client digs their heels in, you have to find a way to make that work. Sure, uh, we, our part of our studio is doing public art and that we see that as a way to really connect with the community and be a source of income for the studio. So uh, my job is to look for different calls for artists. Uh, one of the things the DC Commission on the Arts lists their grants or calls for artists on their website. Other places like uh, call for artists, there's uh, publicart.com, uh, you have different places where the, the calls for artists, and it can be across the country, around the world, actually. They'll say what the budget is, what the parameters are. And that's the kind of thing that you then have to start breaking down what it takes to apply for public art. An important thing is that they will always wanna know what your previous public art is. So if you're starting out, it's gonna be a little bit hard to start at zero, but there are some smaller scale ones, like such as the DC public schools, often have a call for public art and it'll be in the lobby or by a library. So that's a lot smaller scale. We also had a thing starting at this project for the DC Arch that we involved artists who didn't work with glass to be 
and work on public art to be part of the team so they now have a background in installing public art. Do they know the steps taken to be able to say, when you manage a project like this, you have to allow for structural engineering, you have to allow for installation equipment, you have to allow for what the process is on getting permits made. And all of those are gonna be all the unglamorous side of the artwork, but they're all necessary. And some of that we try and go back with the DC commission for this one to say, can you speed up or expedite the permitting process. And if the building's under construction, can we tie into their main building uh, contractors to have the foundations done so that, again, it would save costs. So some of these kind of things you're gonna be dealing with on the fly, sometimes they'll say, it's all for you. If you do a project that's out in Florida, you're gonna have a lot less resources than if you're doing it close to where you are at home. And now you have to take into account the transit time and the traveling and working with, uh, just the whole delivery of artworks and components. But there are places online that you can search for what projects. You're gonna be doing it based on dollar amount. You're gonna be also looking up to say, I want images of previous work. You're gonna to have to do a fair bit of writing to outline what your concerns are, what your methodology is, what your inspirations are. And as an architect, I was able to draw on those things intuitively. It's, it is a challenge. That was why actually that the uh, Washington Glass School co-directors, Erwin and Tim were interested in me because I could speak that language of uh, applications and government forms. So it was just a matter of making myself write more effective ones. The DC Commission also has an interesting thing. They have a lot more of workshops now for applying for the grants and fellowships that you can actually learn what the steps are. So they're very a handy thing online, as well as wor workshops and tutorials. And it is a thing that I would say, if you can avail yourself of anything you can find online, just even look at it to see what tips are. Uh, a thing that I found personally involving and rewarding was I volunteered to be on the DC Commission's evaluation of public artworks that I wasn't applying for so I could evaluate them and speak to it. And I'd see presentations by other artists and say, that is a great way of focusing on artwork and how they are connecting to the neighborhood that I would internalize all those steps myself and say, that's how I wanna do from now on that steps. Same way that I learned from the arch that involving community is a great way to go. That's what you can educate yourself with at each project to the next one to be stronger, better, faster. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes. On this timeline from idea to implementation and having the final product, what did you, I mean, is it the RPH, what did you find the most challenging and what did you find the most enjoyable and why? Okay. Well, the, the idea of saying in a timeline uh, of making the artwork from start to finish, the most difficult one, I'll start with that, was a lot of structural implications. When we designed the arch to go up 13 feet and have two vertical legs on that particular project, there was a lot of raking in the structure. So we started going on about how that the design of the foundation became critical because there's gonna be a lot of movement within the structure. One leg would move at a different rate and it would tear apart the arch. So we suddenly talked about having to build a structure that was a greater density in steel that we had anticipated. And again, our budget started shifting as to how do we accommodate monies for a structure that we thought would be a lightweight structure. Now had to be almost something that could handle uh, floor additions onto it. So it just had grown so greatly that we worried we were losing the nice qualities, which was the glass. We were able to work with the structural engineer to streamline how some of the applications were to use some of the grid work where the glass was as additional reinforcement. And we said that worked for us. And a lot of it was give and take. And a lot of us went from being more uh, free form grids to being a lot more planned grids, but it still allowed a feeling that we felt that with the glass in there, it would still look randomized and uh, multi-hued. The thing that was the most enjoyable, even though you grit your teeth and brace for it, is you're gonna be dealing with a lot of people at once who are all coming in at the same time saying, I don't know anything about this and how do I go? So you have to repeat. It's like a school class with kindergartners all coming in saying, teach me now, right now. And you 
once they are all going and once they're working, it becomes a magical thing where you start having surprise and delight. And I'd say the most rewarding one was we had for one of the libraries, they had different organizations working in the library that didn't know the other ones existed. So when they were working in the workshops that we had for glass, they were meeting each other. And the whole concept that we're making a stronger community by making the artwork was something that I really liked. I mean, personally, I felt like that this is what public art should be, where it connects community and it gives new ways of seeing how you fit together. Now, if you were saying about timeline, some of these projects have impossible timelines. They will be, uh, for the Library of Congress, we started in 2004 and didn't get the go-ahead until 2012. So you have a long lead time. And once they gave us the contract, they said within three months, we want the artwork there. So it's impossible timelines. Same thing with, without naming names, I have a project that we're working on that we had to have guarantees that we could be in by the end of November, early December. We're gonna be looking at installing it next month. So there is a whole delay time that like any kind of construction, you have to be flexible to say construction delays will stop the whole project. Uh, one other project in Silver Spring took 12 years to go from uh, design approvals with the city council to the actual installation. So you have to be ready for a long haul and it sometimes feels like it'll never happen. And you can have projects that never quite got out the ground. And I'm sure architects have long had projects that were only in drawing stage and never had the money to go ahead. So you do, you do are in for the long haul. Well, um, for public art, there's a uh, Instagram, Public Art Glass, and that one goes to a lot of the works by the Washington Glass Studio. If you look up washglass.com, you're going to be connected to both the studio and the school side of the Washington Glass School. And if you go into the different artists there, you can find erwintimmers.com, you can have timtateglass.com or timtate dot com and michaeljanis.com so you have the artworks by the individual artists but a nice thing is that we are having people who are going from working with us to setting up their own studios as i had said that we involve artists who had not a background in it we we realize we're in a sense creating our own competition but again we have people like uh, sean hennessy who's now in seattle uh, John Henderson, who's in Baltimore, who's making public art. And it's kind of nice that you had a resource that you could draw on as you're doing installations or concepts that you're saying, I need another person to come in and help with this project. You are creating competition, but you're also creating a network of support for you. So that's, that's an interesting thing too. And if you look at our websites, you will see that sometimes it connects back to the other artists. Okay, I hope you had a good chance to see some of the glass work and I invite you to come by the glass school. There's always something going on there. We're right over the edge of DC on uh, Eastern Avenue near Eastern and Rhode Island. So take a look at it online and come by and visit us. Thank you.